It was a beautiful day. One of those bright spring mornings when it feels like the monotone of winter has finally given way to the new season, and it won't be long before a dusting of green covers the ground and the first brave crocuses poke their heads into the sunshine. The feeling would be wrong, of course. Alex had sat through enough springs at this window to know that this first day of thin sunshine was a trick of nature, a cruel ruse to make people switch to a lighter jacket and leave their gloves at home. The day would end with blistering wind and stinging rain. Winter again. He glanced at the clock on the wall. 3.15. He looked down across the ragged brown lawn to the stuccoed gateposts. She was late. She usually passed by no later than 2.45. Maybe she wasn't coming. But she did, strolling past in the familiar dark green suit, peplum jacket over pencil skirt, hose with seams and high heels. Her hair was long and elegantly arranged in a style of a bygone era. She stopped, as she always did, near the far gatepost, took a cigarette from a silver case in her bag, lit it, took a drag, glanced up at Alex's window, and walked away out of sight beyond the high walls that encircled his world. Alex turned and looked at the man in the bed. That's what he called him now, the man in the bed. He tried to remember when he had started doing that, when it had changed from me to the man in the bed. There must have been a point, a particular day when he stopped looking like himself and began looking old. Or maybe it was even earlier than that, when muscles slacken, the face changes. It had taken a while, but now there was nothing left of the young victim. No one had visited for years, although presumably the bills kept being paid. The standard of care was high here, and the doctors visited daily, poking and peering and looking for changes that never appeared. Old machines were regularly replaced with newer, quieter, more high-tech versions to keep the body breathing and ensure that it was fed and watered. Capable nurses would turn him regularly in an effort to discourage bed sores, which seemed to work, although they hadn't been able to prevent the gray hair on one side of his head from becoming sort of worn away. Alex ran a hand through his shaggy mop and wondered if that would have happened anyway. At 25, he hadn't given a thought to the possibility of going bald, although a few of his friends had started down the road of careful combing and part adjustment. He sighed, turned away from the man in the bed, and walked to the door. That was the limit of his movement, the room in the doorway. It was the same for everyone. Hey, Alice. What? The voice was young and impatient. I'm watching TV. I know. What's the news? There was a pause. Then the sound of small, patent leather shoes hitting the floor. Alice was eleven, and had been resident far longer than anyone else. She looked like a little girl in an old photograph, with hair trimmed in a Dutch boy cut, a giant ribbon flopping on one side of her head. She wore a red square-necked pinafore over a white blouse with puffy sleeves, and the black patent shoes on her feet clacked as she walked across the hospital tile. Like Alex, she couldn't pass beyond the threshold of her room, but hers had a television. There's another war, she said. There's always another war, said Alex. Are we in it? Not yet. Next week is Easter. Your family will be visiting. Each of the denizens of the hospital was intimately familiar with the minutia of the schedules of the others. I guess, shrugged Alice. I don't really know them anymore, though. Since Maddie died, it's just great nieces and great great nephews. I don't know why they come. What else, he said. Any new shows? Yes, most of them have a lot of... A lot of... Sex? Suggested Alex, grinning. Yes, said Alice, wrinkling her nose. Most inappropriate. And the language. Are they allowed to say fuck yet? Stop it. No, thank heaven. Her tone was shocked, but she was smiling. Alex was always pleased if he was able to make her smile. It had been nearly 70 years since she just closed her eyes one afternoon, never to wake up. Unlike the man in the bed, the old lady that Alice had become didn't need a machine to help her breathe. 
though he imagined she had all the other tubes attached to the usual machines. Eleven. She'd lived so little. Perhaps your people will come this year. I doubt it, said Alex. Even my brother stopped coming. I think that'll be it until the man in the bed dies. You mean you? He doesn't feel like me anymore, just an old man. Someone else. But he's not that old, is he? I guess not. But lying in a bed in a room for a quarter of a century doesn't do a thing for your looks. No, said Alice sadly. What are you watching now? Something called Downton Abbey? It's nice. It reminds me of Mama. I'll let you get back to it then. Thank you, Alex. And cheer up. Maybe you'll get pneumonia and die. Alex nodded and retreated back into his room. Pneumonia. That would be good. But the doctors would probably just cure him and let the whole thing drag on for decades more. He walked to the window again. The glass in the buildings across the street gleamed with the colors of sunset, and the sidewalks began to fill with people on their way home from work. One of them might be his daughter. She'd be about old enough now. He wondered what she looked like. The last time he'd seen her, she'd been about three. His brother had brought her, but she cried and never came back. Why couldn't they just let him die? They had to know that he wouldn't have wanted this, this eternal semi-death, semi-ghost existence. The squeak of approaching sneakers echoed down the hall outside his room. A nurse. It must be time to check the tubes. He hadn't seen this one before, but that meant nothing. The pay was good, but the turnover was still high. Most people don't go into nursing with the aim of a career in ministering to the living dead. There seemed to be a limit to the amount of time that even the most committed and caring could take the pointlessness of it all. This one strode into the room and marched to the side of the bed, straight through Alex before he could dodge out of her way. The whole walking through him thing was disconcerting, and he had never gotten used to it. Each time was like the first, a shivering sense of evaporating and reincorporating, all in a single, uncomfortable moment. He turned back to the window and tried to concentrate on the darkening street. Watching the nurses checking tubes, making sure the blood pressure, blood sugar, oxygen, and heart rate were all as expected, held no fascination for him anymore. At first, he'd hoped they'd find a positive sign. Then he'd yearned for a negative one. But now he understood that it was just going to go on and on for years. Crack. He spun around. That wasn't a normal sound. He looked at the nurse. She wasn't checking the tubes. She was removing them. Crack. Another one hit the floor. Stop! He leapt toward her, forgetting for a moment what he was, and more importantly, that this was exactly what he wanted. She turned to the man in the bed and ripped out one of his IVs. Alex could see her face now. It was pallid and without any emotion but determination. He hadn't seen her before, which didn't mean anything, except she apparently didn't realize that when the IV was removed, an alarm would go off at the nurse's station. There was the sound of running feet clattering along the corridor, quickly followed by Lupe, appearing at the doorway and freezing for a moment as she took in the scene. Lupe had been there longer than anyone else, and over the years, Alex had watched as she had grown older and more tired, heavier and less ready to smile. But she was a good nurse and genuinely cared for each of her unresponsive patients. What are you doing? she yelled. Get away from him! The new nurse ignored her and yanked a power cord out from the wall. This time the alarm was general and deafening. But the nurse kept on going. Lupe threw herself at the woman, trying to force her away from the bed. But even as they struggled, something else was happening. A vibration. Something. Alex shook his head. Was it him? No, the whole room seemed to be shaking. Why didn't the nurses notice? Then the screeching and grinding started, drowning out the sound of the alarm. Alex covered his ears, but he could still hear it, like some kind of giant machine being forced into action after years lying idle. He closed his eyes, grimacing, wanting it to stop, but it just kept going, slicing into his brain. 
He opened his eyes. Lupi was trying to reinsert the IV, but the other nurse dragged her away by her hair. And then there was something, a slight pinprick of light just above the man in the bed. Alex watched, mesmerized as the light grew. It looked more like an opening now, like a window to somewhere else. And still the room shook with the screaming, grinding. The hole of light stopped expanding and opened. That's what it looked like, as if a lens had snapped open, peering through from somewhere else. Alex felt like a sample on a slide might feel, as it was pushed under a microscope and examined by a distant eye. Then the lens was gone and was replaced by a slow drip, then a trickle, then a pouring of something that was like liquid light streaming from the hole and down onto the man in the bed, spreading and sinking beneath the sheets and into his flesh. Alex watched, transfixed, while nurses continued to struggle over the life of the man in the bed. The man who didn't feel, didn't care. Don't just stand there. Help me. Alex glanced at her for a moment, then turned his attention back to the liquid light suffusing the half-corpse. I said help, screamed Lupe. You! Alex stared at her, hardly able to believe what she was doing. She couldn't be talking to him. She couldn't see him. No one could. Still, her urgency made it impossible not to respond. I'm... I'm not... I don't care, just get her off me. Alex hesitated for a split second, then leapt forward and dragged the new nurse away from Lupe, who sprang across the room and hit another alarm. There was a sound of running feet and more urgent conversation, but Alex didn't hear any of it. He was holding her. In his arms. Really holding her. But it wasn't possible. He didn't even notice that she wasn't struggling anymore. Her whole body was heaving, seizing and gasping. Meaty hands pulled him away and shoved him aside as bloody foam began to spume from her mouth. Alex watched in horror as more nurses swarmed into the room, half reattaching the wires to the man in the bed, while the other half pounded uselessly on the chest of the nurse. Alex backed away toward the door. Then the man in the bed, the man who had once been him, opened his eyes and stared right at him. The voice when it spoke was hoarse and thin from lack of use just like looking in a mirror. Ain't it, kid?